Good morning, everyone, and Javier, thanks a lot for the invitation. Very much enjoyed the challenge of um, talking about the renewables policy on the day after the publication of the winter package. I think perfect timing from your side, and I try to make as many cross-references as possible, because I think this winter package is a strong sign that Europe does want to take a joint energy policy forward, and I think energy policy can really be one of the selling points for Europe as well, and we have to get better in bringing the sector-specific benefits of Europe to the broader audience. Because at the end, we've all been using Europe as a fundament on which we kind of try to achieve our sector-specific objectives, but never fed back the benefits Europe brings to our sector-specific discussions to the broader audience. And I think that's one of the main challenges we are facing. If I look just at one of our British participants right now here, um, in where we've um, been struggling so much. Um, As we go forward, and I think that comes quite clear from the winter package, it goes beyond electricity, or there's a lot more integration across energy carriers and across countries. Um, and I think we all see these debates about decentralized electricity production or energy production and um, the benefits of gradually decarbonizing, therefore, our household electricity demand. And I'll show you in terms of areas on this picture what is the relative amount of final energy that is being used in Germany. So that's household electricity. Households use biomass um, for heating, but obviously they'll use a lot of fossil fuels for heating just in Germany. Then we have commerce and service again. Quite a lot of the energy use from electricity with IT and so on bigger than um, in households. But again, heating, the dominant energy share, still fossil fuel based. Then you go to mining and manufacturing, same picture. A bit more coal for particularly um, steel and coal production. Um, steel and um, cement production, and transport dominated by the oil use that we have. Any projections in terms of decarbonizing um, European energy use assume that we have to kind of get away from this fossil fuel use, and the main two energy input sources will be PV and solar. There are some other opportunities, but the dominant part is PV and solar. That means effectively huge amounts of additional energy beyond this little share up here in terms of decarbonizing our electricity consumption in households. That means the discussion about decentralized versus centralized solutions, I feel, is a bit artificial in the context post-Paris. Um, we have to provide so much more energy, often to areas where there's high energy need, concentration need, like for steel plants, um, that it is impossible to only do that in a decentralized manner. That is a strong argument to do it in a European context, in an, um, also using centralized opportunities and cross-country opportunities. It furthermore shows the big benefit that we have by looking across these sectors. We can leverage flexibilities in terms of energy carriers and in terms of adjustments to the demand in these different sectors. A strong part of the energy package, making our power markets or market systems more flexible such that we can adjust. If it's cold, if it's, there is a little wind, perhaps we can adjust energy demand in other sectors as well. And you all know about the discussions about storage from electromobility, but we'll see a lot more interfaces like this in the future. This is then also the basis to look in terms of what does it cost us at the moment. And the main cost that we face for energy is the fossil fuels um, that we primarily import into Europe. That is the blue bar. But obviously, we have some European domestic production of fossil fuels. And let's just assume a moderate externality cost of 30 euro per ton CO2. Then we have roughly 350 to 500 billion euro cost just for the fossil fuels that we use to deliver energy in Europe at the moment per year. If you compare to this what it would cost to deliver the same amount of final energy with a combination of two-thirds wind, one-third PV, just looking at the panels and the turbines, ignoring the infrastructure in both comparisons, um, going 10 years back would have been ridiculous to shift to um, new technologies. It would have been really expensive, at least, with commitment possible, but difficult. If you compare this today, we're in the same ballpark figure. That Obviously, basis is based on a set of assumptions. It's simply we ignore network and other storage costs, both for conventional and renewable technologies, but they are small compared to the primary components of the investment costs. So that, I think, is a fair proxy that we have here. And it's based on 5% annual investment costs. I think, talking about Europe, the big benefits that we will see here is we 
replace money that goes out of Europe um, to destabilize economies that are based on exporting fossil fuels towards using this money in Europe to create jobs for investments. And I think that's in most countries of Europe a very important part. Um, and we therefore also can enhance the energy security by reducing this dependence on um, often very fragile regimes. One more point, which I think outside of the renewable community is often ignored. We have a big debate about incremental cost of um, renewables and a big feed in um, charges that are imposed on final consumers, for example, in Germany. These costs are relatively high they were because we build in Germany, Spain, and Italy PV and wind at times when they were still a lot more expensive up in this peak bigger here, and guaranteed them for 20 years the revenues. That's what they needed to finance the investment costs at that time. That's the backpack that we carry with us. It's sunk cost. As economists, that's easy to understand. In a political process, that's often ignored. But the sunk cost that contributed to the learning of these technologies is what we often talk about. And we debate who carries this backpack instead of discussing together how we continue to walk up the hill in terms of facing further challenges and resolving them. One important assumption of the picture was that um, it made the assumption based on 5% average cost of financing, weighted average cost of capital for these projects. Now you can look across Europe in terms of what are really the costs of financing wind projects in the year 2014, and you can see large discrepancies across the European member states. Anywhere between, um, well, in Greece you go to 12%, but even Spain in 2014, the project reporters, um, um, people reported 10%. What I thought was most intriguing is this very high number of 9%, even countries like Sweden. And compare this to very low costs between 3 and 4% in countries like Germany. The overall levels probably have gone down since 2014 with even overall kind of base rates declining, but the big discrepancies between countries, between countries remain. And they effectively are based on two elements. One is country-specific risks in East European countries and some, some Southern European countries, and policy-related risks. And what are the implications of this? If you go to countries and you pay 10% weighted cost of coverage, then that final bill for consumers of um, shifting to renewables will be much higher here in this red area um, than if you go to countries where you only have 4% weighted cost of cap um, capital to kind of um, go to from fossils to renewables. So the main determinant for the success of shifting to renewables, and therefore the, for the success of any chance of achieving Paris, is what is the cost of capital that investors in renewables will face when they invest in specific European countries. And that is for me the big relief um, after reading the final outcome of the winter package yesterday that had, has become very clear to the European Commission and it's now embedded effectively in the structure of how this winter package goes forward. Because what does it mean? Cost of capital is something that is dependent on the regulatory framework that we have to address this cost of capital. And the regulatory framework now clearly identifies with a proposed renewables directive for post-2020 again that there is a need of remuneration mechanism, or they call it support mechanisms, for renewables because only with support mechanisms that provide long-term guarantees for stable revenue streams, you can get costs of capital that are below 10% and getting into this 3%, 4% or even lower um, range. And in a way that is important, it's ridiculous. If you think about the situation in Germany right now, the German railways, they can issue bonds at negative interest rates um, because it's government-backed infrastructure. At the same time, we have government-backed infrastructure decisions somewhere else where we pay 10% weighted cost of capital. I think there needs to be some regulatory structure that addresses these concerns. And um, the rationale behind this is to say we have effectively different technologies in our system to produce electricity electrons. But they actually produce relatively different type of products in our system with different pro generation pro um, pro profile, with different... Um, decision elements, so if you look at um, the key differences, capital costs for PV and wind are the dominant share. For conventional technologies, it's contracting for the resources, it's reinvestment costs, it's managing these operations. Strategic choices are therefore what location uh, you want to build in the renewables case, what technology choice you want to have, and that's going to be key of what I want to say in the remaining... Oh, 
um, to 15 minutes, um, whilst at the same time, if you go to fossil assets, the question is how much reinvestment you do on a specific plant. That's the information that asset owners have that are not, is not in the um, public context, and it's, there's a lot of asymmetric information around this. Um, therefore, capacity for governments to decide on these renewable dimensions is very high. In fact, that is what was decided yesterday in terms of the Commission again to make a firm 27% renewables target by 2030 for Europe. So there's clarity that that's what we want to have. Now the question is, do we coordinate, and that's Roger's talk going to be about, in terms of how to achieve this objective, or do we kind of leave everything uncoordinated and then create quite a lot of uncertainty for all participants in this context? Um, on fossil fuel assets, the capacity for governments to say which power station to close down and where to make reinvestment is very limited. Do you know the quality of this asset and how do you go through a regulatory process to shut down a specific power station? So we tried that in Germany for uh, three lignite stations. It was very expensive, as you saw with the um, climate reserve um, that was just discussed. And I think that's why I'm very happy to be at a conference that is largely focusing on ETS because ETS has a very important role to play on providing the investment and reinvestment framework for conventional assets, and in terms of making sure that what we are talking about on the renewable side is risk insurance um, against something that ultimately is going to be in the market, in the money. So it's risk insurance in the context where we're talking about remuneration of renewables rather than support. I don't think they need support levels if they have a good insurance policy in place that addresses regulatory risks. So, let me come to three high-level summaries on this part and then go back to the second point a bit further. Policies can reduce financing costs. We've seen the big discrepancies of policies across European countries and they largely explain, or explain half of the cost differences on weighted average cost of capital in European countries. And I'm quite happy that, for example, the Renewable Directive now has an explicit Article 6 which, um, for stability of financial support of renewable um, systems. It is, for example, explaining we have to focus of avoiding ex post adjustments to um, revenue streams that were previously guaranteed because they have been very negatively looked at by our investors. And a big benefit of Europe, we can work across Europe together to overcome short-term political decisions in individual member states by committing jointly to a common framework that stabilizes um, the investment framework across all of European countries. But we can also at the European level um, reduce financing costs or help to reduce financing costs in member states that inherently have higher financing costs at the national level already. And there are two elements now again in the winter package. One of them is requesting all countries to um, open their national support schemes but only open it to 10 or 15 percent of product, um, elect renewable electricity to be produced in other European countries. So you open them and have some joint activity, but at the same time, you clearly retain this national focus of renewable remuneration mechanisms. And anyone that knows about financing is, knows that that is crucial, because at the end, the only way to guarantee 20-year revenue streams is for governments to underwrite this, and that's something that only national governments can do, so we need to retain the clear link to national decisions on the support approaches. Otherwise, we don't get the level of credibility for financial investors and expose them to policy risk. But we do have limited, well, in contrast to the overall investment volumes, but still important capabilities of addressing financing risks also at the European level. We have the European Investment Bank, we have the multi-annual financial framework um, for 2020 and post-2020, which then can be used effectively to help countries that have higher financing costs to reduce these financing costs and therefore make renewables more affordable and the shift to renewables an attractive policy choice for all of these countries. And one element that I think is quite exciting in the discussions right now is if you look at Poland, they have had over the last two summers brownouts at summer daytime. So that's the moment when PV can is the least cost option to quickly facilitate additional generation capacity and how can European cooperation help to make that accessible at low cost finance and that's being discussed both bilaterally between countries and um, it's going to be interesting to see how that can happen from the European level. But again, European financing to support investments in a specific country obviously would expose the European institutions to the policy risk at the member state level. So European financing or financial support for in projects can, from my understanding, only happen in the way where there's clear policy regime at the national level that guarantees the revenue stream 
and that could then be backed by the European instrument. If there's a lot of uncertainty in the national context, then effectively we transfer risks from the national to the European level, and then there is some perverse incentives for member states to say, hey, great, the Europeans pay for this. We can do now kind of make micro adjustments to kind of reduce the cost to our consumers. So you, again, need a stable revenue stream from a clearly defined remuneration mechanism for this approach. And finally, we've been discussing about renewables as something expensive in the past and therefore how to ensure investors such that they can always get sufficient revenue streams in the future to finance the investment. As you saw, the costs of renewables have come down and the cost of fossils will go up and down again in the future. Therefore, any renewable project that benefits from this kind of hedging approach should at the same time provide a hedge to um, consumers such at the time when power prices will go up because fossil costs go up or carbon prices eventually go up, um, they then can ac have access to low-cost financing from renewable projects. So instead of talking about um, premium systems where you effectively get an additional payment if the wholesale price is too low, we have to have something like contracts for differences or feed-in tariffs that ensure you always deliver your energy to this predefined price. It might be that you benefit from the long-term contract as a renewable investor, but it might be that the consumer benefits from the stable revenue price um, at the other time around. So I think to make sure that we have the symmetry and the fairness to all participants in Europe in this context. One element that gives us a lot of freedom in terms of further design of renewable remuneration mechanisms is um, the energy part of the wholesale market pack part of the European energy package, um, the winter package. Because in the past, we tried to move away from support mechanisms and they provide very stable environments to something where effectively generators have to sell their power on the wholesale market because the wholesale markets were so badly designed that you needed very strategic actors to sell the power in there to get some money out of this wholesale market. So effectively, bad design of power markets was the reason that we could, we had to kind of give incentives to kind of sell your power very strategically to get at least some money out of selling your power on the short-term market arrangements. And in a way, that reflects the kind of chain, um, challenge of the wholesale market, um, that on the one hand, wind and solar have some level of predictability, but there are some adjustments in the last hours. So you'd like to trade in the, also close to real time to make these adjustments to the wind forecasts or solar forecasts. Whilst at the same time, coal assets typically can schedule day ahead and therefore would like to kind of optimize day ahead. And then obviously they have to make some adjustments if a coal power station drops um, or in the last moment, but more active activity ha happens day ahead. A good power market during a transition period therefore needs to accommodate both for the opportunities and needs of conventional assets and of renewable assets and effectively has, have liquid competitive markets that are cost reflective at all periods from day ahead to real time. And that is something where I'm really happy that now um, the regulation on European electricity wholesale markets c comprises an element that mentions that we can have intraday auctions for power. And that is something where we just published yesterday um, the report of a future power markets platform where together with uh, regulators, TSOs and generators and power exchanges, we've been discussing for two years now how these intraday auctions could be structured and you can see some elements on the website in terms of what that means in terms of the benefits they can provide if they are added to the continuous intraday trading. And therefore they would improve the liquidity and the depth of the market. They provide good reference points for long-term contracts which again you need for the flexibility options in the system. Uh, they allow all players to participate and get the same price out of it which is particularly important for a small assets, but it's also important for renewables because in a way, if everyone selling to the wholesale market gets the same price, even a counterparty for a long-term um, renewable contract, whether public or private gets the same price if they put the um, power into this market. So it doesn't matter anymore how we structure um, this element of the support part. Um, it is good for the system altogether at the European level to avoid loop flows, to ensure technical feasibility. So there's various benefits of moving down this avenue. For me, it's the biggest element of the wholesale market design package if we look forward, apart from the capacity part uh, market discussion, which perhaps we'll get back to at other parts of the debate. Um, now, having this flexibility from the wholesale market in terms of designing a renewable remuneration mechanisms, what do we need to consider in these design choices? One is make sure that we allocate risks appropriately. If you think of a risk or the cost of a renewable project, you have the cost, then you've got a risk premium for the project performance, and that's 
something that needs to remain with a project developer or owner because they best can manage the performance, the maintenance of the specific technology. Then we have risks or uncertainties associated with how will transmission constraints be handled in the future, what will be the specific um, price at a specific location in the future. That's look de determined by regulatory structures like grid expansion or power market design. The same about um, energy price risks, um, which determine a function both of wholesale market design, of ETS market design. Um, then we have got aspects which are related to policy design for the renewable side. If you have traded certificates, you have market risk associated with this and the resulting market price. Um, so what we found in cash flow assessments then is to say, even if we only shift very small additional parts of these risks, so I think by now it has become bro broadly accepted that one has to move away from exposing investors to this renewable policy design market risk. So tradable certificate schemes are out of the debate anywhere across Europe, I would argue. Um, there is a big debate going on now as to how much additional incentives or risks we should expose investors to about balancing costs, about locational elements um, in the revenue streams, and about wholesale markets into the future. Um, now, in all three of these cases, um, they create additional risks that are rather difficult to manage for the investors. But obviously the intention behind it is to create incentives to build the appropriate location and system-friendly technology choice as we go forward. On the risk side, if you only think about very small risks component like um, balancing costs and within the country the location element, that would already, um, according to our calculations, increase the costs for building these renewables. If you think of, was a few years back, that calculation, if you wouldn't have any of these costs allocated to re renewables, you would need 87% for some wind projects. If you allocate the costs, first of all, shifting costs doesn't matter. At the end, the consumers pay for that. So you would have to increase the re remuneration to 89 euro per megawatt hour. That doesn't matter because at the end, it's just kind of allocation back and forth. But in addition, that would it's unclear what these costs will be in the future, what balancing costs will be in the future. And these additional costs then imply the additional risk premium that you have to add um, to um, pay for these activities. And that increase uh, by further one to five euros per megawatt hour, the cost of these renewables. Um, so therefore, the alternative is to say, can we create incentives for appropriate tech locational choice and create incentives for appropriate designing, um, um, dimensioning of the turbines in the design of the remuneration mechanism. For a long time, we've already got in Germany a system that we have effectively an adjustment of the re remuneration you get for your wind turbine according to the wind speed of this location. Um, and you see here roughly in um, the dotted line how much does it cost to produce our megawatt hour of electricity at different locations in Germany. If there's higher wind speed, it gets cheaper because the same turbine can produce more output. But at the same time, the tariff is adjusted according to the system as well, such that you don't um, benefit very much at very high wind speed locations or you can, can continue to build at low wind speed locations. It has been criticized in the past, but ultimately I think people started to understand that we need both the high and the low wind speed locations, and therefore this is a way of unlocking these potentials at lower cost to consumers without of paying large um, scarcity rents to landowners at very high wind speed locations. And you can see actually the discussion at the very high wind speed locations at the North Sea. That's where landowners get a lot of money because effectively the feed-in tariff is not adjusted as much as it would need to be to kind of go fully away from the system. So one can move more to a cost-based remuneration uh, adjusted on the technology basis. And it's fascinating to see how um, Mexico in their auctions for renewables implemented a somewhat different but very valuable approach. They um, instead of um, looking from the cost base, how much does it produce cost to produce renewables at some point, to a value, what is the value of a wind turbine in specific parts of Mexico? And then they took effectively um, this calculation um, and to say in certain parts of Mexico, power is a lot more valuable. So effectively, if you bid into the auction, we increase or we decrease um, the bid price according to the location such that we choose the bits that are most valuable to the overall system. And we then guarantee your bid for 20 years. So you can consider this benefit, but guarantee it then for 20 years. Ah, that was my second year as well. And what this ultimately achieved was low financing costs, 
as you can see from the outcome of the auctions, whilst at the same time ensuring that the system needs are reflected. And I wanted to go to, but I'll jump across this now, the same discussion you can look at in terms of whether turbines are system friendly or not system friendly, so how big is the rotor dimension, and um, there's a, the slides you'll get to see later on. Um, so let me just summarize with one slide. Um, how can renewables support Europe? I think as we go from just decarbonizing our household electricity demand to decarbonizing European energy demand, it's clear that we have to look at the integrated system across energy carriers and across countries. Otherwise, the scale of the challenge is just impossible to achieve. And um, I think that's where the cooperation across countries is really big and beneficial. Um, as we shift to renewables, it's economically viable to do that and creates a lot of jobs, energy security and other benefits that are really something that Europe needs at this moment. The key for the success is something that is now embedded in the post-2020 Renewables Directive, that we have to continue with renewable remuneration mechanisms as basis for low-cost financing as we are going forward, um, eliminate regulatory risks, um, facilitate cooperation between member states, which is in there. I think the part that will be most discussed in the coming month is how we can use European financial instruments to allow countries that have higher cost financing to get access to low-cost financing and invest in larger scale renewables as they go forward, and how to make the European power market fit for this element, uh, the intraday auctions as one element of this part. And the second dimension where I think we are on the starting point only for the debate is how to design our renewable remuneration mechanisms such that we get incentives for good location and system-friendly turbine and solar choices. And the important part there is not system-friendly for today's system, but system friendly for the system in 10 and 15 years because the technology will be there in the future and that is something that the remuneration mechanisms have to reflect and happy to discuss all of that in more detail over coffee. Thanks. <laughs>